Welcome to uh, a sales interview with Dave Stark. Uh, Dave and Jody finished fourth in the U.S. Sailing Champion of Champions regarded this past weekend. The event was held in MC Scows, a boat which they had never sailed before. You know, that's pretty remarkable considering that they were in the mix with two very good scow sailors. And so uh, and also for the third place boat, which was skippered by Chad Proctor. Uh, so two non-scows right in there, scow sailors right in there with everybody else. Uh, just a little bit about Dave and you'll hear more as he talks, but Dave and Jody have an incredible resume of victories in the, uh, primarily in the lightning class. But the neat thing is they sail both separately and together in that boat and almost always are, or vast majority of the time anyway with family. Uh, Jody's a Yola, uh, Rolex Yachtsman of the Year and Dave's a two-time uh, finalist in that area. And Dave, I understand that Jody qualified for this regatta independently, but decided to sail with you? Yeah, that is true. She, uh, uh, earlier this year, uh, the Lightning class has uh, a world championship every other year, but this just before the world championship is the master world championship. And the criteria there is the skipper must be 55 years of age and then a total crew age of over 130 years. Um, so prior to that, uh, uh, the world championship, Jody and the team sailed the master worlds and won that regatta. Um, my team and I, fortunately, I'm a little too young to uh, <laughs> just by a little bit to sail the Masters. So I was out practicing every day watching them. And uh, so she did get an invitation to this uh, to the U.S. Sailing Champion of Champions. Um, but um, she decided it would just be easier uh, to sail together. Yeah, great. That's amazing. Yeah. So we thought it would be interesting to hear Dave's insights about several things about this regatta. And uh, so welcome, Dave, and thanks for your willingness to speak with us. Sure. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Let's start with the, which, which I think is the mo most remarkable piece. You're a big proponent of family sailing. Uh, I've looked at several articles on the Internet about uh, your views on that and your commitment to it. I'm going to add some links to those articles to, the, to this video. But could you briefly talk about that role, uh, that importance of that family sailing role? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. Thanks for the opportunity. Um, Jody and I have two daughters, two teenage daughters at this point, 14 and 16, Sabrina and Jamie. And, um, you know, for years, Jody and I have been standing together, as you mentioned, together and against each other, primary in the light, primarily the lightning class, but other classes as well. Um, and uh, many of the times it's just easier to uh, put together one boat versus two boats. And, uh, but really family sailing to me is, it, while it is sailing with Jody, and, but really it's, it's incorporating the kids. That, that's really, in my mind, family sailing. Um, and it's funny, once upon a time, um, a great American sailor, Paul Forrester, uh, who's, who's won Olympic medals and he's really a tremendous, tremendous individual, he stayed at our house for the Sunfish Worlds uh, several years ago. And um, I'll never forget him telling us, listen, uh, your kids are going to learn a lot more sailing with adults, maybe not necessarily with their parents, but with adults on board. Almost what we talked about just before we started this, this call um, about uh, learning from others. And the kids will learn more from parents um, and from sailing with adults and perhaps from a coach just by listening to what you talk about during a race, what's important, what's not important. Um, so we've really incorporated them into our lives as it relates to sailboat racing, uh, not leaving them at home, but getting them on our boat, on other people's boats. And I got to tell you, now that they're at this age uh, where they're really assets on the boat, um, and that, that's been, uh, we're seeing the fruits of, uh, of our time, spending time with them, when they're really just toddlers, but we'd bring them out there and made it fun. Jody's very good at that. I'm not as good as she is, is making it fun, especially when you're in the midst of a race and you're, it's a tight quarters and they just want to, you know, drag their feet off the side that she's, she's good at that. 
Well, I, I read one about actually dragging them behind the boat for a while, I think. That, that, was a, that was terrific. We have some of that here in the scow world, too. A lot of family sailing with multiple, you know, people on an E scow or an A scow. Well, Jody and I both mentioned, boy, the MC, what a great boat platform, if you will, for having little kids on the boat. You can go race around the buoys and they can have fun, you know, doing whatever they want to do. Yeah. Uh, good spot for it. Yeah, great. Let's talk about scows next. I understand you had not pre had not previously sailed an MC scow. Um, they're a little different, I think. And uh, talk about how you prepared and and what you learned either before or during the event about sailing the scow and the nuance. Yeah, I, I just I have one clarification. I, I had sailed one, I borrowed one uh, just a month or so ago uh and 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 really learned that there was you know two dagger boards and what lines where and how to step a mast and sailed it a little bit by myself um and i, I asked guys i borrowed serge vanderhorst's boat who's a friend of mine from ohio and asked guys like al Hewn and matt fisher who are both good friends um but none of that uh that i should say i'll pal to actually sailing against another scow and understanding uh, some of the nuances of the boat. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had sailed it a little bit, but never in a race and never next to another scout, which is really yeah. an eye opener. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but all being said, we, um, first of all, we love the boat. It, it's, a, it's a great boat and, it, and I can just tell it's a phenomenal uh, uh, class of people. Uh, which really is what is the number one thing in my mind of any one design class. It's the people. Uh, but we, our experiences as we sailed the regatta over, over several days, um, we, all these voices that I heard of people giving me advice were coming to, coming to fruition, meaning the amount you have to heal the boat, uh, not pinching, so really, it's, it's like the opposite of some of the sailing I normally do. Really letting the boat, um, you can really find when the boat's in the sweet spot, when you're healing just right, not pinching, the boat just starts to track. That's the u word Jody and I used a lot. Boy, the boat's tracking well right now. Um, we, we, we would sail by guys like um, Matt and, and Bill Dreheim and Peter, and we would take a look over as they were crossing at where their uh, traveler might be or how much main sheet tension. And we would just absolutely emulate what they were doing because uh, we, 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 were, we weren't sure. Um, particularly the traveler, I, I, I have to say, wasn't a lot of talk about traveler and any talk that we, we had prior to the event was just leave it in the middle. And I, and I think to some degree, that's fine. But as the conditions changed, particularly when I got windier, um, we felt the boat, I felt the boat felt much better with the traveler down. Um, she did on hard, lots of Vang. I, I, Al told me these North sail, main sails liked Vang. So we, we sailed with a lot of Vang. Um, we would pop it off around the top mark because it was windy. But as soon as we were going downwind again, Jody played the Vang. And... Uh, we spent an extraordinary amount of time adjusting the Vang downwind. Puff coming on, Vang on. Puff, you know, lighter air, Vang on. And then um, I, I also think, especially on a day like the last day, it was pretty breezy where we're two up hiking. Um, in the, you know, lots full out haul uh, and a lot of Cunningham as well because the mains are, are pretty deep, just trying to flatten the sail. We, we sailed, obviously, two of us, we sailed at 270 pounds. That was our all-up weight, which a lot of folks uh, said that's a good weight to, to, sail, the, to sail the MC. Um, and, and, I mean, obviously, if it was windier, you want more, and later you want to pick a, pick a weight. It, it was, uh, I thought, pretty ideal. Mm -hmm. It would be neat to hear if you had a couple of tactical or strategic successes or failures that you you know, could talk about in some detail. You know, we, we um, again, I'm going to go back to, uh, I talked about 
Paul earlier, but uh, I did a regatta once with Bill Shore, who's a, a great sailor and uh, a, someone I always looked up to as a kid, um, who's a world champion and, and probably a lot more than one or two classes. But Bill, I did a match race event with him once in the Sertle family, Corey Sertle, who used to be the president of U.S. Sailing. And uh, Bill, Bill would say to us, we're sailing a type of boat that we know well but we're not great, great match racers. So let's focus on what we do well. And I thought about that when we sailed the MC, I thought, I said to Jody, we, we know how to race sailboats, um, but we don't know how to race very well. So let's focus on what we can do well. And, and, and the reason I say that is what we did is we knew in traffic, tight lane traffic, we were not going to excel. Um, particularly at the starting line or any any decision of a port starboard or a lee bow or what have you so we always decided we need wide lanes and let's start on the starting line where others are not if that makes any sense um so we would watch where people were setting up particularly if the pin was kind of favored we would start up toward the boat the lines were short and all three days were relatively shifty so um, our thought was let's be able to start and tack if, if we want to tack to port and not be in tight lanes. Anytime I was in tight lanes, I just didn't have the skill to be able to hold that very well for very long. Uh, so to your question, you, that, and, and I would say even if once we know how to sail a boat better, that I still think that, that there's, there's validity to starting with – a hole below you, it's like sailing 101, nice hole below you. Um, the ability to protect the port, if that's what you want to do, and not let others dictate your your race. Uh, we always, when we took someone's transom, if we wanted to get onto their tack, we always waited maybe a few extra bold lengths that we would normally wait because we're we're not as as proficient in the mc as as perhaps that other person the other team um that venue we sailed it i i sailed there before uh in lightnings um it, it's a beautiful place to sail it was tricky it was tricky for the race committee too frankly uh who, who by the way did a super job um and uh, it seemed like the edges paid a lot the middle was sometimes not always a good place to be where you see the boats on the port, port, or port side of the course lifted on the lefty and the same with the right side of the course or the starboard side and a righty. Um, and many times both sides won, but the folks in the middle, sometimes that was a tough spot to be for those reasons. Um, not always, but mostly. So, and the same thing downwind, I really, we think about this in our own sailing. I think it's better to be away from other boats in the scow. I mean, whether you need to jibe away and, and sail on port, get into your own sailing area so you can just sail your boat and not worry so much about the guy next to you. Um, boats together tend to go slower. And particularly in the scow where the, the, the difference between going slow and fast is sometimes knots, not just tens of knots. Uh, I mean, that's my experience. And then the other observation, I suppose, was particularly where it was lighter. Uh, half the boats were sailing with leeward heel and the other half were sailing with weather heel. Um, never flat, of course. And, uh, you know, Joe spent a lot of time looking at the MC sailors trying to figure out, well, Bill Dreheim and Matt Fisher and Peter are all heel to leeward. Let's, let's heel to leeward or vice versa. And I'm sure there's others uh, that sailed the boat uh, who were doing the right thing. Those were my three bogeys that I know, though. Well, I don't know. I didn't know Peter, but I knew he was doing quite well. But Bill and, and Matt, I uh, would use as my uh, as our gauge. So that that's key. But the healing part of it is, is uh, I would just echo what everyone had told me, that you can't say enough about the importance. And it's just because the way the rudders, or excuse me, the dagger boards are, positioned on the boat mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so were there any uh, tactical moments that were you know interesting to talk about would you say 
in in that. And I know you had a lot of races and a lot to remember. It's amazing how many races you had. But tons of races. The races were probably anywhere from twenty five to thirty minute races. They're pretty short. You know, they really try to get a full rotation and they came up a little short, but not, you know, they, they maximized every minute of the three days of racing. Um, and it's funny, after all those races, you think there might be a little more spread between the point total. Um, you know, we were fourth. Chad beat us by, he had a breakdown one race. So he had an average score of six point something, 6.4. Or six. So he beat us by 1.6 in the regatta and then we beat the next guy who's a great clay johnson great sailor by one point and really first and second were only a few points ahead of us so it was so tight um and but to answer your question um and, and any boat can say this jody and i on the drive home we were trying to figure out where we could have gained 10 or 15 or 20 points and, and you know they add up pretty fast we um, with that many races, you can imagine if you if you shaved off one point a race, you would we would have won the event. Now, every same thing. So I, I respect that. Uh, I, I, but I would say with the shiftiness, um, if I had to do it all over again, I would have pushed the edges a little harder. I, I'm a I, I'm not an edge sailor. I don't like getting the lay lines early. Uh, I think more times than not, that's bad. Um, so I like to tack underneath, to lure it in the head and underneath and not out on the edges. But this particular event, I think you would have been fine more times than not sailing to an edge, either edge, as I mentioned earlier. And Bill Drayheim on the last day, I have to tell you, he did a great job. We sailed next to Bill, I felt, the whole day. We could have thrown a line to each other and just towed each other. And I would say four or five times when we were where I thought on a ley line, uh, whether we're either way, where we were holding him out, if you will, meaning he was either below, he was below us both times. We would tack, he would go further, almost overstood. And a hundred times out of a hundred, he not only passed us, I mean, if you saw those last few races, he won every race. And we were next to him or ahead of him in, I think, every race of those three. And we finished where we finished, and he won them all just by taking the extra leverage. Um, but am I – that's just not the type of sailing I'm used to doing, but it would have paid at this – well, it did pay at this event. Yeah, and it's tough to know when that's going to work and, and sort of why it works or doesn't. I, yeah. I've been trying to write an article about that for years, and I can't – Bring a, you know, I don't know enough. <laughs> yeah, well, and I always, you know, going back to the family sailing, if the girls are on the boat, uh, we, we talk about these things. And like, well, why wouldn't we just over make, we, you know, even overstand by a couple degrees and then he's overstood further. And I'd say, well, if we do that, we're on the Portek ley line, the wind goes right. We just sailed a lot of extra distance. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the same for the... There's no worse feeling than being on a starboard tack ley line overstood, watching everyone below you sail up to the mark. Mm -hmm. um, uh, as I said, that worked at this event, but that, that's um, that's a strategy that I'm probably not gonna, you know, I'm gonna stay away from that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we could also talk. You've talked about weight uh, a little bit, and Bill posted a little Facebook thing about weight, the importance of weight. Um, did you feel severely handicapped with uh, two on during the first couple of days when it was lighter? No, I, I thought uh, I, the answer is no. I, I never thought. Um, and again, I don't know enough to know if what I'm going to say is accurate. But uh, I, I never thought that we the, the boat felt like we had too much crew weight at mm -hmm. two step. To me, it, it, it never even entered my mind. Uh, and I think the, the, the minus of having too much crew weight, uh, in lighter air, uh, it far outweighs is that not having enough weight in heavy air. I, I think that even Peter on the last day, he hung on to win, which, which is awesome for him. Uh, but he struggled a bit more when it got windy. 
Uh, sure did. And it seemed like the, 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 the line in the sand of breeze, if someone asked me, give me the number, I'd say it's probably 12 to 13. As soon as you get in that range, uh, you, you, you know, unless you're a single individual and you weigh, you know, 230 or 240 uh, or more, um, I think it's better to have two people all day long. There's just no question in my mind. Yeah. Good, good insight. I mean, in the scout world, you probably, you may not know, but we, we are allowed to change crews between uh, races and lots of people like you uh, are, you know, my, some of my lightning sailor friends think that's ridiculous, uh, but we do that. And so now you have to make a decision and that was tough, I'm sure for Peter, but. Uh, well, if you, it's not ridiculous if you have a very understanding crew who really enjoy sailing and they enjoy hanging out on a powerboat. Not bad. Well, yeah, but people feel it's unfair to be able to, oh. to switch between crew and not when not everybody may have a tender boat or a you know a spectator boat. Right. So, yeah. Yeah, that's uh that that's you know, I haven't had that experience. I, at one seventy, um I, I don't know that I, I would probably just always bring one of my daughters or Jody or I'd crew for one of them, certainly. Yeah. Um, because any combination of the four of us would be to me, a decent weight to sail. Yeah. Excellent. Well, did, let, I have a couple more quick questions. I know we've taken probably more than 20 minutes, uh, but did you do anything with tuning of the boat uh, in terms of mass rake or Side stay tension. There's not a lot you can tune. You can change the spreaders a little bit, but uh. well, um, it's funny you ask. Uh, you you the boats were all tuned for us, and you could not touch the standing rigging. Oh, um, so for us uh, newbies, I was happy about that because I wouldn't have known what to do. So uh, all the boats were tuned identical to w however the the tuning folks decided what would be the best mm -hmm. and you were allowed to touch the rig. So I'm not sure how to tune one and I never put any thought into it because I knew they were all going to be tuned and we couldn't adjust. That's great. How about sales? Did everybody have the same sale and, and cut of sale? Everyone had North sales. Everyone had North sales, North sales, uh, provided the sales. They may have been pre-sold. I'm not sure the logistic of that, but we all had the exact same sale. Um, and the reason I, uh, when I got breezy was, was big on, uh, the Vang sheeting was because that's what Al said works for him. And they were North sales. I, I would imagine different sale makers might have a different view of how you set up the, the, that particularly with the Vang, but uh, it seemed to work well for this boat. A lot of Vang sheeting with the trap down a little bit when it got windy. Yeah. Well, David, thank you so much. Um, this has been a wonderful interview. I'm sure our readers are going to get a lot out of it. I should have invited Jody, but that may have been too much of an ask. Um, <laughs> she, so. I'm sure she would if she's not here, but she, I'm sure if she, if, if she was here, I'd drag her in here right now for a quick, a quick uh, hello, but she's not. Yeah. 